we begin the discussion for PR1 this afternoon. By the way, by sheer count, I think your class now has a total of 20 student participants or 20 students, which would mean that we might end up having 10 pairs of students in total for wild season. I did earlier. Okay, so, so once again, it just might result to having 10 pairs in total. And I have yet to come up with who's going to be paired with whom. Or I am still really torn with two options. That I decide on who your pair will be. Or you come up with a decision of, of who's your, your, your pair for the doing of the research. Last year, the style was that students were given the chance to have their own pairs or to choose, to choose their own pairs. That was quite a, an assurance on my end that there's really no reason for them to not finish the research since the pair whom they have, the other person whom they, they've been paired with is a person of their choice or that there was an agreement between the two to have that kind of setup. Compared to compared to me letting you be paired with someone, you might not develop a, a feeling of comfort or that you feel like it just might affect the dynamics of your group. On that matter, on that end, I'd like to give the challenge that for this week, for this week, I'll give you the opportunity. This is not yet final. This is not yet final. Just for this week, though, I need you to have a choice of a possible pair that's not yet final again but if i if i find your pair up quite fine if i don't see any issue with a pair up you've made then i'll stick with that i'll agree with what you've you've chosen so this week again i'm giving you the opportunity to choose your own pair since there are only 20 people in this class, in uh, there are 20 students in this class, that would mean 10 pairs. Sir, what if, as others may say it, it sounds unfair, sir, because the ones who are doing well in their subjects have ended up paired together. I tell you people, that is never an assurance of a successful research work. Just because there are people in this class whom you feel like are doing well doesn't mean that right away they'll have a successful research paper. In fact, that is more open to problems because of pos higher possibilities that these two people will end up having conflicts in what they want to put in the paper. Sir, what if, sir, my pair is someone who isn't doing so well in his or her subjects? It doesn't mean that the person cannot do well in research. All of you here in this subject right now are, I think, taking research for the first time. Not one from you in this class has a first-hand experience of how to do research when you were in junior high school. So I think everyone is in a, play, is in a fair situation. Everyone is playing this fairly. So it, let, let's not do labels. Let's not put labels that... Sir, my grade, uh, her grades are low, so I should not be paired with her. His grades are high, so I should be paired with him. Sir, they shouldn't be paired together because they are already they already got very good grades before last school year. Let's put away that mentality. I want you to once again choose a person whom you feel comfortable with as you are going to work on research. However. That pair up is not yet final. Okay. If I if I do not find your pair up, if I yeah if I do not find any issue with a pair up that you've made with what your class has made, we will settle with that. But what if what if uh, how many are you twenty again? What if fourteen students have already been paired? So seven pairs have already been made. And the six remaining students don't have pairs yet or have not chosen their pairs yet. So, and then if I do not find any issue with the seven pair ups, I'll do the pairing of the remaining six students. Because again, 
you don't also want the research to be delayed because of your difficulty to choose a pair or because of the lack of chances to have your own pair. So, to those who just got into this call, wait. to those who just got into this call, once again, I'm reminding you that as for this week, you are requested to choose a pair of your own like or yeah of, of your own liking you choose the person with whom you shall be doing your research undertaking this semester in fact that same pair will actually be working with you until the second semester don't worry yourself of what's going to happen next year think of what's to be done this school year for pr1 and for pr2 by the last time I'd be able to meet with you is Thursday. No, Thursday. Class, who's the class mayor? Class mayor. Lorraine? 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 Hello, Lorraine. I don't know if Lorraine could hear me, though. I'd like to request uh, by Thursday, Thursday, in any of our classes, in oral com or in philo, remind me of the final arrangements of the pair ups that you have made yourselves. So these names will have to be said in class. Like for instance, I'll call in Thea. Thea, who's your pair? My pair, sir, is. By the way, when you declare who your pair is, let it be an agreement between you and the person you have chosen to be your pair. We do not want that when Thea says, Sir, sir, my pair is Viona, and then Viona will just end up being surprised. Sir, I, I didn't know that I was the pair of Yona. Let it be agreed. Let it be that there was an agreement within the two of you that the both of you will do uh, will do this research undertaking this semester and during the second semester. Any question regarding the initial plan? Initial. Any question regarding the initial plan for the pair ups? If there's none, we'll pro I'll have a share screen with you for the discussion this afternoon. This is the structure of your seldom break class. Your seldom break is a bilayer of Sorry. protein and fats. Okay? Your seldom break is a bilayer of protein and fats. The circular representations there. I hope you could see this screen. Molecules. As for the, I, can everybody see this? As for this afternoon, what we'll do in PR1 is to create a differentiation of qualitative research and quantitative research. So you have here qualitative research and quantitative research differentiated. PR1 aims, we aims for the creation of a qualitative paper and PR2 tries to do one which is quantitative in nature. But here's what ha I'd like to also give you ahead of time what happened, or I, I think I've shared this already before, but as a sort of a reminder, this is what happened last school year. PR1, which is qualitative, in, which is for qualitative research, wasn't able to proceed with data gathering. There wasn't any data that any of the pairs or groups gathered last year. But they, it didn't mean that they weren't able to accomplish anything. Last year, the students were able to create a chapter one. That chapter one was made ready such that, sorry, such that if the students were to carry it for PR2, it can be easily, it can be easily tweaked to whatever is the style or the technique to be employed in PR2. Again, it might have come out that no data were gathered for PR1. I just do not want you to also think of your PR1 output in the same way this sem. If we could gather some data this semester, why not? But at least the minimum target that we should be able to achieve this semester is the completion of your chapter one. Let that be our minimum target. So we begin the differentiation by looking at the definitions of these two types of researches. So we define quanti and qualitative researches. Starting with quantitative research. We are, I'm going to pick out on some important points. 
quantitative research is an educational research. So the goal of any type of research actually, not just for qualitative but also of quantitative research, is to provide some form of knowledge, some form of understanding, or maybe there's a new discovery that research wants to relay to the readers and to other scholars or to experts who are in the same field where that research is actually being conducted. In this kind of educational research, quantitative, the researcher decides what to study. How can that decision be made? The researcher asks specific and narrow questions. Compared to, I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just flash as well the definition of qualitative research. If you look at the questions asked for qualitative research, they are broad and general. In fact, when researchers try to obtain data to respond to these questions, the data obtained from qualitative research would come out to be so much and researchers are not going to stop the participants from revealing whatever information they could reveal as a response to a question. Let me give you a sample research question. Quantitative research. What is your age? That is a quantitative question. Narrow and specific. Because that kind of question can only be answered if you ask that to one, to one participant. That will yield just one information. One basic number. One number. And that's it. If someone says, if the participant reveals... I am 18 years old. That's it. That's the specific and narrow data that you have obtained because your question is also specific and narrow in itself. Let's go to a qualitative question such that the answer is not also narrow and specific. What if, as a researcher, you ask your respondent, how do you feel? How did you, how did you feel when... Um, how did you feel when your grades are lower this semester compared to your last semester's grades? Let that question float and then the respondent might say, I felt quite bad because... See, when the, when the respondent provides that elaboration of the feeling, the researchers cannot stop the respondent. Plus... Think of it, uh, think also of this one. When you asked of what that respondent felt, did you give options of what, the ex what are the expected choices? You did not. So from the very beginning, you did not limit the respondent's opportunity to provide an answer to the question. Because in the first place, the question raised in the qualitative statement is broad and general. Again, the question is, how did you feel? You did not present options, so you are going to make the participant think back of what emotions were felt. Or in fact, no, it could be a combination of emotions. One participant may give just one emotion. Another participant may give a combination of emotions. That's how limitless the possibility is for the answering of the question. Because again, in the first place, for that qualitative endeavor, the question is broad and general. Second, in quantitative research, data comes out to be quantifiable. Which means, in relation to that, data turns out to be numeric. Your data can only be quantifiable if they are expressed in the form of numbers. For instance, what is your age? And then, sorry, the question is, what is your age? So respondents may choose from 13 years old, 14 years old, 15 years old to 16 years old. Depending on the number of respondents who, who chose that age, you could actually count, right? If Thea says, I am 14 years old, Alex says, I'm 15 years old, Rain says, I'm 14 years old. That would tell you that out of the three, two are 14, uh, 13 years old participants, and one is of a 14-year-old age. So you have managed to count your data, which makes it really quantifiable. 
compared to qualitative research such that the data is actually consisting largely of words or text. And in fact, you cannot expect that the words or text given by one participant could actually be the same as what another participant provides. Take for instance, let's go back to the question of how did the participant feel? I see may say, I, uh, as, as the person whose grades are lower this semester than last semester's grades, I felt quite worried. I also felt quite anxious because I'm not sure anymore. Then comes a lie. I felt bothered. I felt disappointed. I felt frustrated. You cannot just simply count at IC as one person for one person for uh, anxious. Then a lie is one person for bothered. No, it doesn't work that way. What you would actually do for qualitative research is you will give honor and credit to everything that IC said and let that come out really as the data. The same goes with a lie. Sir, can I not combine a lie's answer with IC's answer? You cannot. You just cannot really do that. Because if you do, you just might... I, I, sorry, allow me to change my answer. You cannot always do that for qualitative research. Because if you do, you just might end up with an interpretation that says two out of the particip out of the total number of participants. The moment you create a statement that's that's in this framing, the research is really quantitative, not qualitative. That is why if you are to interpret something like that, you can just actually come up with framings like a feeling of disappointment came out from the respondents. This feeling is caused by. There's also this feeling of anxiety. See, so far with the data, with the, with the interpretation that I've done with the data, did I talk of how many? I did not. Did I talk of the number of people positive of that feeling? I did not. Because the moment I touch that act of counting for the number of persons uh, who provided that information, that's again a touch on quantitative research. Let's proceed. Since quantitative de research deals with quantifiable or numeric data, the analysis of it will use statistics. As for qualitative data, the analysis involves themes. Statistical treatment over thematic analysis. Statistical treatment, we give that to quantitative research. Thematic analysis, we give that to qualitative research. I, I feel like you had a statistics class in junior high. Did you have statistics class? Correlation, uh, Pearson R, familiar? T-test? Familiar? Do they sound familiar? Measures of central tendency. Mean, median mode. Percentage. Weighted mean. Oh, you just kept on nodding your heads. <laughs> Because actually, those are very useful as you are going to do quantitative research. You will capitalize on your knowledge on these many formula the moment you deal with quantitative research. Sir, is there, is there an, a, a definite treatment across researches? There's none. The treatment you employ depends on whatever it is it is that you wish to accomplish in your research. If your research wants to do a comparison of two groups, then there are plenty of t-test formula around you. If you want to compare at least three groups, analysis of variance could at least cater to that. If you want to see what happens with event A, coincidentally as event B occurs, Pearson is the basic correlation formula. If you want to determine whether the rank of one unit affects its bearing in the entirety of the research, then you have your spearman raw correlation that's available. There are plenty, again, of available treatments. And then we use them because our data are translated into numbers. We count 
our data. But we cannot do that. We cannot use any of them the moment we touch qualitative research. Since qualitative research is filled with text, textual data, so we end up doing a thematic analysis. A thematic analysis is an understanding of what's common in the ideas presented by respondents. Uh, I'll use once again the names of IC and Ally with a question earlier of what did you feel when your grade the, uh, when your grades this semester are lower than your grades last semester? IC might say, I felt worried. I also felt bothered and anxious. Then Ally said, I was really anxious with my grades and I was really mad at myself. What was the common feeling that I see and Ally felt? That feeling of anxiety. Both are anxious. But I, as the researcher of the qualitative format, I will not say two participants shared a feeling of anxiety. Again, I will not. Because the moment I mention a number that has a touch of quantitative research. So what will I do? I presented already a possible statement earlier. A common feeling from the respondents is the feeling of anxiety. See, that's what's common. That's a theme in the responses. And then I did not indicate how many out of the number of resp respondents that I have provided it. I just wanted to determine which feeling was common across my participants. Next, quantitative research conducts the inquiry in an unbiased, objective manner. Compared to qualitative research, which is subjective and biased. Please, let's not look at subjectivity and bias as negative for qualitative research. The subjectivity in qualitative research, as well as it being biased, comes out because the research, a qualitative research, may progress depending on what comes out. Compared to quantitative research, when people do quantitative research, they are settled already with what they have already preset even before data were gathered. Compared to qualitative research, for example, uh, let's go to age. Let's go to age. The, the examples that I gave earlier. When you are uh, when you ask a respondent, "How old are you?" Then the respondent says, "I am 18 years old." And then you might put a follow-up. How many are you in your family? The, the respondent says, we are seven, including my mother and father. Next question. Who provides the income in the family? The, question, the answer, it's my father. Look at how objective everything is. You are, you are limited because of the objective responses, objective purpose of the research. It cannot go, your, your intent cannot anymore go beyond the questions. Even if the questioning proceeds with, uh, are you happy with the setup in your family? You'll provide options. Yes, no. If they say yes, okay. If they say no, okay. You tabulate. Or you, you acknowledge the response, you tabulate how many said yes, how many said no, period. Let's put that, let's twist that into one that's qualitative. What if, what if you initiated the questioning with, are you happy with the setup in your family right now? And then there was one respondent who said no. As the qualitative researcher, you will rather be pre uh, uh, provoked. You will really be provoked to ask your respondent of what led that feeling of unhappiness of your family setup. See? You went with a follow-up question because it is in the nature of your research to dig deeper to fully understand family dynamics. It may not have been your initial intent, but you just needed to do it in order to be more substantial in your research. Let's have another example. You ask your respondent, 
um, uh, let's let's imagine that the topic is teenage pregnancy. You ask your respondent. How did it happen for you to be this uh, to be a parent at this young age of yours? Then the respondent said, "I was young at the time and." I was I, I I fell in love at an early age. Then you throw in a follow up. Me, uh, if you don't mind, who is this person you fell in love with? Is he a friend or or uh, a stranger? Uh, just an acquaintance whom you met in school? And then the respondent says uh, he was actually a live a uh, childhood friend uh, and also close to to everyone else in our family. And then you make another follow up. When this happened between you and your childhood friend, how did your parents perceive the situation? Then the respondent says, they did not like it, of course. And then you make another follow-up. And take note, when you made those follow-ups, did you have them prepared ahead of time? You did not because you are completely unaware of what responses might come out from your respondent. From your participant. So earlier I said it. Your study in a qualitative format will progress as you also continue doing your research. That is why it comes out to be subjective because it just depends on what comes out. It just depends on what happens next. The researcher comes up with a, comes up with a decision. With this being my initial data, what will I do to, to solicit more information? It's not like quantitative research that when this data came out, okay, that's the end. When the respondent said that the, the experience of, of going to school this school year is not satisfactory, okay, that's quantitative research. Don't worry, people, because there is also a mixed method research. A mixed method research attempts to do quantitative and qualitative research at the same time. It's a combination of both. For instance, uh, the topic is about bullying. Let's talk of bullying. And then, question number one. Do you know, or no, have you experienced bullying? And then, yes, of course, yes, no. If you answer yes, Elaborate the situation on what happened. If you answer no, don't proceed anymore to the rest of the questions. What if the person answered yes? So there's an elaboration. Has the elaboration been limited? Was there a limit set on the experience of bullying? There was none. But where is the quantitative element of the questionnaire? When someone answered yes, you could actually count the number of people who said yes. And that will be tabulated later on. Like if out of 60 people, 57 said yes. That is quantitative. What makes it qualitative? The common experience of bullying was anchored on their elementary years. That makes it a common theme. That's the theme that was obtained from the experience presented in the elaboration. So that provides a combination of quality and quantity researches known as a mixed method research. Mixed, M-I-X-E-D, it's not M-I-X. It's M-I-X-E-D with a hyphen, mixed method research. Let's continue differentiating quantity and qualitative researches in several categories. In terms of objectives, quantitative research aims at the quantification of data, which would also include measurements of incidences or occurrences, measurements of events. In fact, it's not new for research to deal with frequencies, quantitative researches. It's not new for quantitative research to do account of the number of times a particular event had taken place, place or occurred. As for qualitative research, it is geared more on the in-depth understanding of reasons and motivations as well as of why events had taken place. Why feelings come out? Why situations happen? 
qualitative research tries to explain that. I mean, the examples I provided earlier, I think are strong enough to explain this. The experience of teenage pregnancy, that example earlier. See the, see the making of follow-ups? With whom did this happen? How did your family perceive it? How did you react to the reaction, to the perception of your, of your family? What, did, what were your plans when it happened? The moment you threw in these follow-ups, that's the research being converted into a qualitative format. That's the research trying to have an in-depth understanding of the situation or of the one, uh, of the one being studied. In terms of data analysis, Quantitative research is really statistical. I mean, in the first place, it relies with numeric or quantifiable data. Sir, what if it's just a mere survey? That's still going to require statistical data. Statistics. Your measures of central tendency will still come in. As for qualitative research, data is obviously non-statistical, contextual depending on the nature of the question, depending on the intent and purpose of the of the research tool and then thematic it's just a matter of what came out as a common theme as a theme of the responses sir what if you've been talking of common themes sir what if out of my five respondents nothing was really common then that would mean you'll have a really sub sorry you'll end up having quite a lengthy presentation of what the data are. Because no theme came out. So you'll have to really indicate what the ideas are. Without mentioning any number of one respondent said this, one respondent, no, you will not have to mention that. The, if your study is talking about emotions, the emotions will really just have to come out. You will really let them be represented in the paper. In terms of outcomes, quantitative research provides broad insights while at the same time being population-based. As for qualitative research, it is not conclusive nor generalizable. Here's, um, in, in this part of the discussion, I'd like to inform everybody that quantitative research deals with more people compared to qualitative research. For quantitative research, you could easily deal with 200, 300, 400 participants. But if you want to do a qualitative research and you plan to do it to 200 people, you're actually doing a so uh, how do I call it? A research suicide. It will never be beneficial to you to do a qualitative research with respondents exceeding 10. So what do you mean? Two, three, five participants, that would actually be enough. Five would actually be more than enough for a qualitative research. I don't know if you've heard of this term, a case study. I don't know, maybe, you, maybe you've read that somewhere or, or you have looked at it in, um, in a reference online. Those people who do case studies would involve a maximum of three people. I mean, the field of research would accept a case study that had involved three respondents only. Why? When, you, when people do a case study, it's as if they are already living together with the person who is part of the research. They are observing the life of the person almost 24 hours up to the time that the research is being done or completed because they, they want to make sure that everything is still kept authentic. Nothing will have changed. Nothing gets altered when the researcher isn't anymore with the one under observation. So that's what makes the few number of respondents needed in a qualitative research. Last year, for that pair who wanted to do a research on uh, single parenthood, single parenthood, not teenage pregnancy. To those who wanted to talk of single parent, to that pair who wanted to talk of single parenthood, they actually had two respondents. They found two participants. Out of the many, actually two 
volunt- uh, it, it's not a volunteering, but it's actually that to express their willingness to be open with as much information as they could. Because we cannot also blame the... Uh, and like I, I think I've mentioned it last time. We cannot force participants if they say no. No matter how hard we try to get information from them, and if they find that they will not say yes, we cannot just force them. If they persist, no, I will not really say anything. We cannot do anything about it. Respondents will have to simply settle with the fact that they could not get as much as in, as much information as they want to from the respondent. So two volunteers, I, I think you can say it's a volunteering. Two volunteered to willingly express what they could. Unfortunately, we just ran out of time last semester. But take note, oh, two only were enough to count as respondents in the qualitative research. As for quantitative research, the more people you have, the better. That's why uh, I'd like to put this on, on record. That's what makes the population here in IA quite a problem when it comes to data gathering. If you go to other schools, because so many of student researcher researches would make use of students as respondents. If you go to other schools, the population is not the, the number of respondents is not an issue to them. Because they have so many people in just one room. There were several years in IA before where the total high school population would just be equal to one classroom in other schools. That made it really challenging. Plus, if we consider the population, we are actually supposed to take a sample from that population. For instance, you have five, uh, 500 respondents. Using statistics magical 30, 30%, the minimum number of participants allowed by statistics is 150 people. So your 150 comes out as the sample of the entire population. Whatever the data are or whatever the interpretation is, for that 150 is made to be true to the entire 500 population. Again, that's what we mean here by population-based understanding. The sample represents the characteristics of the entire population. So, if your sample would say, we all felt uh, there's this feeling of sadness in us, 150 of the 150. Remember that's the question on what did you feel when your grades are lower this semester than last semester's? What if the sample provided a feeling of sadness? When you generalize the interpretation, you can assume that that feeling of sadness is true to everyone in that population of 500 people. However, generalize, uh, generalizations are not allowed for qualitative research. If someone, uh, especially that you don't have so many people being tapped for qualitative research, if, if in that qualitative research a respondent said, there's this feeling of anxiety, you cannot, gen gen you cannot generalize that feeling to everyone in the population, to everyone in the 150. That feeling holds true only to the participant involved in that research. Anyway, later on, maybe especially when we proceed to PR2, we will talk of sampling and population-based understanding. But for the purpose of differentiation, again, quantitative research is broad. Its results are population-based. As for qualitative research, we cannot arrive at a result that is conclusive nor generalizable. The results in a qualitative research are true only to whosoever are involved in the research. In terms of methodologies, quantitative research has preference or precise hypothesis stated at the outset of the research. Even before the research has actually proceeded with data gathering, there's already a hypothesis. I, you should be familiar of your null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, in statistics. 
By the way, which between the two are we highly suggested to use in research? Null, alternative. I hope the terms don't sound unfamiliar to you. Alay, give me a sample alternative hypothesis, Alay. Give me a sample alternative hypothesis. Again, again, sorry, sorry. Wait, have you forgotten what an alternative hypothesis is? Problem solving, you had a class on hypothesizing with Sir Jeff in problem solving. You did, you did. Last year, I I heard you holding that sub lesson with Sir Jeff. I'll ask Sir Jeff, huh? Did you have a class on making hypothesis with the with, with the great great ten students last year? Batch of Leja, you did no problem solving. Problem solving, making hypothesis. Or like alternative null hypothesis, statistics. I, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not Sir Jet said yes. <laughs> Sir Jet said yes. <laughs> yes, Alai, go Alai. Okay. Um, I, I was about to go there. Um, alternative. I didn't ask for the null. I, you give me an alternative. In, 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 in another way, similar with lysosome. The only difference is that when you talk about lysosome, it will disintegrate not only healthy cells. Again, okay, sorry, sorry. Cells, yeah, yeah, a bit. Sorry, sorry. Okay, turn that into a null. Because your white blood cells is filled with lysosome, and since white blood null. cells is more with the red blood cells, and the nature What's of your null? Cells is yes, Alai. Decaying or foreign invaders, and when your white blood cells will not anymore breathe, is that the null hypothesis? Cells, which is the red blood cells being eaten, then comes now that there is a particular characteristic of the null hypothesis that makes it obviously a null hypothesis. Rain, can you give us a sample null? Peroxisomes is not phagocytic in nature. Okay? Peroxisomes is not phagocytic in nature. For, for, for. Go rain. Sample null. But peroxisomes is going to you're, you're on mute. You're on mute. It's responsible for cell damage. In itself, it will merge into a dead cell and it will just like. You're on, you're on mute, rain. It will disintegrate the dead cell. It will what about, uh, I'll call someone okay. else. Naika, can you give me a null hypothesis, Naika? Girls are fond of drinking a supplement called Perry. Perhaps your parents are Correct. The mosquito repellent cannot repel mosquitoes. Give me another null hypothesis, Leja. Hey, Leja is opening Google. Oh. <laughs> I saw the the screen in your glasses, Leja. I could see how it got reflected. There is one word in Nika's hypothesis that made the hypothesis in null one. What word was that, Nika? It's like this way. Correct. The presence of a negative expression. The presence of a negative expression constitutes so much the characteristic of a null hypothesis. And when you de when you are to do your research, it is rather with a null hypothesis that you should structure your hypothesis. They say that the null hypothesis is easier to reject and it doesn't have much of a psychological burden if it ends up getting rejected. Uh, anyway, when we proceed to PR2, okay. we'll talk of so, how to reject, when to reject uh, that hypothesis. If in quantitative research, hypothesis is stated at the outset, in qualitative research, 
the hypothesis may emerge as the study develops. And again, this reminds us of how subjective qualitative research could become. But it doesn't make qualitative research a, a negative kind of research. Quantitative research has preference for precise definitions, which have already been stated and cleared out at the, onset, at the outset of the research. How, however, for qualitative research, these definitions may again progress, depending, in the, depending on the context of the research. In quantitative research, your data is translated into numerical scores. But for qualitative research, data takes on the narrative structure or in, is, is presented in narrative description. You also pay much attention to assessing and improving the reliability of scores obtained from instruments in a quantitative research compared to a qualitative research where there is a preference for assuming the reliability of inferences and that is already considered to be adequate. When people do quantitative research, since the data is expected to be generalizable across the population, the instrument will have to go through several reliable, not probably several, or rigid reliability testing. So they do pilot testing, they look at the validity of the questionnaire and the reliability of the items in that questionnaire. To make sure that one item really is geared towards asking what it could ask from the respondents. As for qualitative research, the assumption is that the reliability of inferences is enough. Like whatever, the, whatever is provided, that is because there were already questions or the tool is already filled with what's just enough to solicit this information. Or perhaps the question is just of this number, but when the time comes that data are actually being gathered, the questionnaire, sorry, the researcher is ready with a set of follow-ups to continue probing and guiding the, res the respondent into whatever the, questionnaire, the researcher wishes to achieve in that research. Just because the research tool contains only five items doesn't mean that the, in the actual gathering of data, only these five items will come out in the form of questions or like maybe in the form of questions. Even if your questionnaire contains only five questions like uh, stated in question form, the researcher is free to provide follow-ups and many probing questions such that the respondent will be able to provide the right response or the necessary responses to be obtained in that research. Lastly, for qualitative quantitative research, assessment of validity is done through a variety of procedures with reliance on statistical indices. While for qualitative research, there's an assessment of validity through cross-checking sources of information, also known as triangulation. With the data in quantitative research, there are particular statistical indices which serve as basis for interpretation. Take, for instance, in the significant difference. Recall your lesson in statistics. Can you still recall the term level of significance? That the level of significance is at 0 0.05. The level of significance is at 0 0.10 or at 0 0.01. These levels of... You just nod your head. What about for... Did you not touch Pearson? Correlation values. Like the value is... Uh, the, the value could be... Correlation is very high. High, strong, moderate, negligible. If you look at correlation values, you'll find that they are expressed in numbers and that the numbers have descriptions. And these are statistical sample statistical indices. But for qualitative research, cross-checking sources of information would come out as a way of validating or assessing the validity of the data. Assumptions of quantitative researchers. 
according to quantitative researchers, there exists a reality out there independent of us. And, and that reality is just waiting to be known. It is the task of science to discover the nature of reality and how it works. And that's what drives the researcher into doing the research. To know the specifics of that world or of that reality. Research investigations, according to quantitative researchers, can potentially result in accurate statements about the way the world really is. And also, it is possible for the researcher to remove him or herself to stand apart from that which is being researched. Since the researchers, uh, since the research which is quantitative is also objective at the same time, the researcher is not necessarily involved anymore as much as how it is done supposedly with qualitative research. Uh, like that of the third one. For a qualitative research, the researcher has that difficulty in setting himself or herself apart from the individuals he or she is studying. The researcher tends to develop more time, invest more time with the participant in the gathering, especially when it comes with the when it comes to the gathering of the data. The researcher would like to spend more time obtaining information. In fact, there are several methodologies for qualitative research where the researcher physically and literally lives together with the participants under study. Also, in, for qualitative researchers, the individual, individuals involved in the research situations construct reality. Not that there's an existing reality and that the people will just have to simply live in that reality, for a qualitative researcher, the reality can be constructed. It is not necessarily one that is already true and existing, separate from the individual. The individual has the capacity to create such a reality as a construct of that individual. Also, qualitative researchers think that research investigations produce alternative visions of what the world is like. One person's form of reality may be different from another person's form of reality. That is the alternative that's available. Remember the question earlier of what did you feel when your grades this semester are lower than your grades last semester? IC's response is one version of a reality. Ally's response is another version of the reality. We will not let Ally's reality be right away combined with ICE's reality. But when we do it for quantitative research, we are going to create an understanding of what the world is. Coming from IC and Ally's opinion, what is this reality or what is this world? In qualitative research, what is ICE's world? What is Ally's world? I hope you could see the difference there. And that ends the presentation. Ooh, time is 3.28. Questions regarding the differentiation between quali and quantitative research. When I attended the research conference in Palawan in 2019, May of 2019, we were encouraged to do qualitative researches. According to our speaker, the world is already filled, especially in, re in the Philippines. Our deposit of research already has so much of the quantitative structure. There, aren't so there are already existing re qualitative researches, but they are not yet in the same number as the number of quantitative researches that has been accomplished. So our speaker encouraged us, do more qualitative researches. Qualitative researches should rather be the in kind of research in this era. Done are the days now that people will still do research of academic performance and what are the factors that contribute to academic performance. We will now, supposedly the world is over that. Sir, what about the concept of replication? In fact, that's what already tired 
the, the research community. The research community has grown tired already of reading so many of these quantitative structures which bear more or less the same result. Different people were involved because again, they're doing replication, but the results have turned out to be the same. So the truth has already been established. But what about the in-depth understanding of these factors? That's what the world needs. What, that's what this research world needs as of this time. Questions regarding quality and quantity researches being differentiated. Questions. Your module has five questions to answer, no? Found at the bottom part. So we'll share our answers to these five questions on Wednesday. As I am about to dismiss everyone, I'd like to remind you once again. On Thursday, you should be ready with who your pair is. Initial plan. Sir, what if we are ready with this, sir, by Wednesday? I'd welcome that as well. You tell me on Wednesday. Yes, Lorraine. What's your question, Lorraine? How can we contact Angel? Angel, Angel is here. Angel Heart is here. Oh. Angel is in this call. Hello, Angel. Because there. Oh, Lorraine would like to contact you. <laughs> So Angel is here. Is Angel not part? Are you, are you already part in your group chat, Angel? Uh, please try to join the group chat of your class because from time to time, there will be plenty of important announcements and reminders there. Also, I think, Lorraine, you can ask for the contact number of Angel's mother from Sir Jeff. By the next time that we meet, we will discuss the answers of the module and I will prepare... Hello, I'm, I'm really not sure because I'm not part of the group chat. <laughs> Not, I mean, not in this grade levels group chat. Anyway, you can contact your classmates later on. You can ask them of whatever the name is of the group chat that you have for this school year. Again, uh, on Wednesday, if you are ready for the group, for the repair. But again, let it be agreed between the two of you. No one should say, Alexa, what if Alex would say, Sir, my pair is Viona. Uh, my pair is Leija. And Leija would rather tell me, Sir, I had a pair, sir, already in mind. And it's icy. So let it be one that's agreed between you and the person who will come out as your pair. If you are ready with this by Tuesday, by Wednesday, then that's fine. If, you, if I find no issues with the pairing, then we'll proceed with the pairing. If you end up have, Wait, 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 wait. Before I forget. Before I forget. One of you is now worried because uh, I could see the reaction in the face of the student. Last week, one student from your class expressed the willingness to do research just by herself. I was really, really impressed. I was surprised, but then, but then later on, things started to sink in, and then I told myself, who am I to deny this student of her wish to do research by herself? I think who I think you know who this student is that I'm referring to. It's a lie. I was really surprised, but I would not want to disappoint a lie. If there's one, oh, let's also do it this way. Sir, I feel like I'm more effective if I do this by myself. I will not stop you if you want to do research by yourself. I'm trying to put you with someone. I'm trying to put you with a pair so as to minimize the workload. But, sir, I feel like I could be more efficient if I'm just by myself. I will not have to rely on someone. I will not have to wait for anything from any person. I'll work by my own pace then, sir, I want to do research by, my, by myself. That is why I'm not refusing Alai's request. Since Alai has requested that she does research by herself, she won't be frustrated. So to whosoever wants to be the pair of Alai, just... Yes, I see. 
Ah, to those who wish to be Ally's partner, try to reconsider that because Ally has expressed that she is more comfortable doing research by herself. Never would I lie to any of my students. And for the meantime, that will be it. Goodbye and thank you, grade 11.